Neuropathic pain is caused by a lesion or a disease of the somatosensory nervous system. Knowing whether or not a person has neuropathic pain is crucial to help guide management strategies, like helping the person to make sense of their pain and choosing specific physiotherapeutic or pharmacological interventions. So let us show you how you can use the neuropathic pain grading system in your clinical practice. The grading system includes a set of four criteria, which will help us to determine the presence of possible, probable or definite neuropathic pain. This already shows you that this decision is not black or white. The more criteria are fulfilled, the more likely the person has neuropathic pain. In criterion one, we consider whether there is a medical history with a clinical presentation that suggests a relevant neurological lesion or disease. We look out for temporal developments. In the case of painful diabetic neuropathy, a typical history is a diagnosis of diabetes, which several years later is followed by tingling, pain or numbness in the feet. In other instances, a mechanism of injury may be reported that can point to a nerve lesion. We also listen for symptom descriptors that are suggestive of neuropathic pain, such as electric shocks, shooting, pins and needles, burning and non-painful sensations such as numbness and tingling. While a single descriptor leaves a lot of uncertainty, the presence of several neuropathic descriptors increases the likelihood for neuropathic pain. We further consider symptom behavior. The presence of spontaneous pain is typical for neuropathic pain. We also consider aggravating and alleviating factors that point towards a neural structure, such as an increase of pain upon movements that close the spinal foramen, while postures that open the foramen may decrease the pain in people with radicular pain. The second criterion examines whether the pain distribution is neuroanatomically plausible. This means a stocking distribution for length-dependent neuropathies, such as painful diabetic neuropathy. For painful radiculopathies, the pain distribution should be roughly dermatomal. So, both criteria 1 and 2 depend on a careful clinical history and interview. This means, listen to your patient. If both criteria 1 and 2 are fulfilled, then a patient's presentation is classified as possible neuropathic pain. If only one or none of these two criteria are fulfilled, the presentation is considered to be unlikely neuropathic pain. We then move on to criterion three, which asks whether the pain is associated with sensory signs in the same neuroanatomically plausible distribution. This should be probed through a sensory neurological examination of both large and small fiber function. A comprehensive assessment of touch, vibration, pinprick and thermal sensation is ideal. We typically look for negative sensory signs, such as partial or complete sensory loss of function, but positive sensory signs, such as allodynia, may also be indicative. A range of tests that consistently point towards the same pattern increases our diagnostic certainty for neuropathic pain. In contrast, Sensory loss that sometimes occurs in nociceptive or nociplastic pain does often not follow neuroanatomical borders and is not reproducible across different sensory modalities or over time. If criterion 3 is fulfilled, a patient is classified as having probable neuropathic pain. We are of course fully aware that a busy clinic can prevent detailed sensory testing but clinicians should be mindful that taking shortcuts may impact on the level of confidence in interpreting their findings. Sensory signs may be accompanied by motor signs, for instance, myotomal or reflex deficits. Since neuropathic pain is defined by a lesion of the somatosensory system, motor signs are not a prerequisite for the determination of neuropathic pain. Nevertheless, Loss of motor function relevant to the patient's presentation may increase the suspicion of a nerve lesion. Criterion 4 requires an objective diagnostic test 
to confirm the suspected lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system, explaining the pain. In case of carpal tunnel syndrome or diabetic neuropathy, this could be sensory nerve conduction studies. In the case of painful radiculopathy, this could be spinal imaging, showing a nerve root compromise. If criterion 4 is fulfilled, patients are classified as having definite neuropathic pain. While the presence of a confirmatory diagnostic test can increase our level of certainty for neuropathic pain, these are not always indicated and also not necessarily required to initiate targeted management. Guidelines recommend neuropathic pain-specific treatments such as neuropathic pain medication from probable neuropathic pain upwards. If only the requirements for possible neuropathic pain are met, but a clinician has very strong suspicion for the presence of neuropathic pain, for instance due to relevant motor signs that fit the symptom picture or very high ratings on neuropathic pain screening tools, treatments targeting neuropathic pain may still be appropriate. We hope this grading system gives you a directive to determine the certainty of neuropathic pain in individual people. The grading system nicely showcases that this decision has nuances that require careful integration of knowledge collected during medical history, sensory examination and, if available, specialized diagnostic testing. As such, the grading system should ideally be applied within and augmented by the clinical workup rather than considered in isolation.